Hello and welcome to the Waterstones podcast. I'm Will Rycroft and in this episode it is my pleasure to speak with a writer who from their debut novel 23 years ago has held both readers and critics in rapt attention. That author is Zadie Smith and that debut was of course White Teeth which went on to become a multi-award winning bestseller. And whilst the novels that have followed that book uh, have taken readers to different parts of the world, she has for many been an essential chronicler of life in London. And her new novel, The Fraud, is set once again in our capital city. But in a surprise to some, including possibly the author herself, it is set during the Tichborne case of 1873, which makes it her first historical novel. And in the conversation that we'll have Hopefully, we will discover what it was about that case and those involved in it that caused her to give in to the genre that she has avoided so assiduously over the years. <laughs> Zadie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> now, I suspect that as you go on to do the publicity for this book, the first question that everyone will ask you will be why you decided to write a historical novel. And I want right. to flip that ever so slightly by asking you why you have resisted so long when it's clearly something you excel at. I think I, I think I don't have a very professional outlook when it comes to writing. I don't, um, you know, I don't kind of raise my eyes above what I'm doing. So I, for me, it's just uh, book after book after book after book. And I'm never really thinking about genre or even market, maybe to, to the um, chagrin of my publishers. But um, I honestly didn't really think of it as a historical novel. Of course, I knew it was set in the past, but to me, a historical novel is something that uh, imitates the the tone and of its time. And as far as I'm concerned, the sentences in this book are not anything like Victorian sentences. So it, it's about Victorian people, but it's not written in a Victorian style. And you can go even further that way. Like my friend Adam Thurwell's written a brilliant novel set in the 18th century, um, but the language is absolutely contemporary within like enormous comic effects you know so people are passing messages back and forth across town but to Aria it sounds like emails of course in his case it's notes being passed through Paris over and over again in one day so you can have a lot of fun with the contrast between a contemporary sensibility and the past I guess mine is um not as radical as Adam's in that sense but I definitely want a Victorian sentence you know there's no point in writing for me there's no point in writing a Victorian novel again there's plenty of them around so this was more a contemporary novel about the Victorians yeah um when I first heard you speaking about this book it was a, a couple of weeks ago and we were opposite Kensal Green Cemetery inside yeah. of which uh, at least two of the novel's characters are buried William Ainsworth and Eliza Touche and yeah. I wondered whether either of those people were the initial spark for you wanting to write this book and, and whether that remained the case throughout the writing of it well, that's the very weird bit of the story in that I had spent, you know, a decade reading about William Mainsworth, which is not easy to do because he, I mean, as charming as he is as a person, the books are really, really bad. So it really is a labour to even, I, I can't say I read them all, that would be a lie, it's impossible, but sometimes it was really hard to read these novels, even for the purpose of a comic novel, you know, the idea was a funny book about a ridiculous man. So I, I did all this reading then the book got progressively darker in topic and tone and um, along with reality, I guess, <laughs> as reality got darker, the book got darker. Um, and then when I finally sat down to write it, um, all that was meant to happen, that Mrs. Touche was meant to open the door, you know, and be a kind of housekeeper in the background. So I can't really explain how that, just from the first chapter, she just kind of took over. It doesn't really make sense, of course, because I wasn't reading about her because there was nothing to read about her. There's a, a few letters, a few random statements, not by her, like letters by other people, a few clues here and there. But she was not in any way a figure. You know, she's completely anonymous, like so many women of that period. So it, it was a surprise. But I think a lot of the time when I'm working, it's quite subconscious. And I obviously had, had enough of William and suddenly decided I didn't want to write a novel about him as I was writing it. Yeah. So you mean, you, you when you said it, it really was that instant, you started to write the very beginning of the book, because it does indeed open with yeah, her. Yeah, she was meant to door. open the door, and all of that's true. His ceiling fell in because he had too many books on the second floor, and that's something I really, I don't know if you can see around this room, but there are too many books. Um, so it was meant to be, that was always the first scene of the book, but I didn't think she was going to hang around. But But not only did she hang around, the whole thing ended up being 
written by her or thought by her in one way or another. Yeah. yeah. You have said recently that, um, and this is a quote, generally speaking, I don't make notes. I sit down, I write a novel. And obviously this is a very different kind of book to the ones you've written before. But I wonder with a character like Eliza, because there was so little from the historical record from you to draw from, did that make it easier to write her as a character because there was all that space for you to write into? You know, until about two years ago, if I'd been on a Zoom like this and heard a writer saying, you know, I sat down and this character spoke to me, I would have been, <laughs> that's my usual reaction to that kind of nonsense. But but the truth is, that, that's how it was. I just, it didn't, I didn't have to do very much when it came to her. She just always seemed to be, right there and I I don't know why that is of course she must be like me in some ways but she's really not like me in a lot of ways but she just was very distinct in my mind and I, I guess I knew that the novel would be in some way about Catholics and Catholic thought um, and Catholic literature even so that, that kind of explains why she came to the fore maybe because I have been thinking about that a lot and and then there she was yeah She's a really fascinating character because she has so many facets to that character. Um, there is this interesting relationship she has as a housekeeper to William Ainsworth, but it isn't just simply the relationship of an employer and employee. That there is a sort of sec there is a sexual relationship between the two of them at one point, but then yeah. there is a really interesting relationship that you explore with William Ainsworth's first wife. Yeah, there is a, a, a sort of a queer love story right. in the background that, there that came out of I mean when I was reading these Victorian histories I just kept on being struck by how complicated people's romantic lives were I think we have this very kind of flat version of the past where so I've got a brace in which is why I'm listening all the time sorry I've got an old lady brace in um we think of these marriages as completely you know Puritan maybe or Victorian or, or flat in some way but when you actually read uh, the novels of the period and the history of the period, that's just not the case. Like marriages were incredibly complicated, very often involving three, four or five people. And many of the people in the novel, which I didn't even get into because they didn't want to write forever, had extremely complicated love lives. Like Crookshank had two wives, something like 20 children in two different households. So what we call polyamory today or triangulated relationships, they were unbelievably common. I think when you get to Bloomsbury, you know all about it because they spoke about it. Mm. But it had been going on for a very long time because that's what humans do. So I was kind of interested in demonstrating that Victorians weren't um, as buttoned up as we thought they were. Um, and then the relationships in the novel, I kind of took the clues from his novels. In his novels, there's an enormous amount of what we would call S&M sex. He wouldn't call it that. But that's what the scenes are. You know, there's all these scenes of domination and masochism and men kind of being tied up or, you know, in some, often with two women. So I took the hint that something must have been going on in his imagination. I kept coming back to these erotic scenarios of two women, bondage and all the rest of it. I was just kind of fascinated by it. And he was notorious. You know, they his novels were a bit scandalous. Everyone bought them because they knew there'd be these kind of sex scenes in them, very high dramatic sex scenes, often with ties, often with spurting blood. So I thought well, that's unlikely to come from nowhere, <laughs> that kind of <laughs> fixed idea. Um, and then there was another clue. I mean, first of all, the biggest fact is that when he was a young boy, 18, he wrote a book of poems, love poems. He dedicated them to her. And there's a love letter in the original version that you can see in the New York library, written to his cousin. So he's 18, she's 25. She's married to his cousin, but he's written her a love letter. So one can imagine when his cousin died, he saw an opportunity. Hmm. His cousin was dead, his wife was dead, he had three children. Uh, he invited her to live with him. And it seems odd that they lived together for so long <laughs> without um, meeting other people. And when he finally did marry again, he married the maid in the house. So. He seems to be a man who takes his sexual opportunities where they appear, like right in front of him. Um, and for my purposes, you know, I was interested in what it's like to live a life without a language for that life. And queer life is a really interesting example, right? The language develops over time, but the life has always existed. But that's true of a lot of our social arrangements. We do things without having concepts for them. And that's part of what the book was about.
another one of Eliza's amazing uh, sort of character traits, if you like, is, is her her fascination in what life can offer you. There's an amazing scene where she w- wants to follow two women just walking down the street because she's interested to know who they are and what's going on. That seems to me to be part uh, partly a reflection of, of your work as the writer. You were clearly fascinated by Eliza to sort of follow her and see where she might take you. Is that fair? Um, yeah, that is fair. I mean, a habit we have in common is walking. I like to walk and and look about me and and she does that all the time. And that anecdote, I got that from a history book. I was just fascinated to find out that uh, in the 1860s and 70s, there were a lot of pickpockets in London who were mixed race couples. So one black woman, one white guy, one white guy, one black guy, partly because it distracted people who were kind of, and so one person would go and do the thieving and then they share it amongst themselves. And I thought that was kind of cunning ploy. Um, so I like to give the idea of Eliza following such a pair down the street. Um, but also just because the Victorian streets would have been so fascinating to look at. There's just so much going on all the time. Mm. Um, and I, London is still fascinating to look at, but only parts of it, like Kilburn High Road is fascinating, Hackney is fascinating, but a lot of it is kind of cleaned up and sterilised in the centre. But in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, the bustle was everywhere, and I think it must have been thrilling to see that. Mm. Andrew Bogle is another fascinating character in this book. Uh, and for those listening who who may know or not know about the case, he was sort of one of the one of the witnesses, if you like, the, the man who had a connection to the Tichborne family, who said that the man, the Tichborne claimant, was 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 the real man. And uh, there's this real change, I suppose, in the perspective and and the pace and the and the power of the novel when you take us to Jamaica back in time to basically trace out his whole life up until. The trial and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about the work that must have been required to write that section of the book and I suppose in a way the responsibility you must have felt in telling that side of the story yeah. I really had to I really had to block it out I think for to write it like but when I finished it it occurred to me it sounds it might sound ridiculous to read it but it occurred to me oh this could be like my people are from St Elizabeth this is from St Andrews I'm talking about someone who who is or could easily have been my great 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 grandfather my, certainly my great 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 grandfather would have been a man just like Bogle in exactly the same situation but in order to write it I had to not um think about that I think it had to be I wanted to know what it was like what was the truth um and to do that you have to put your kind of I had to put a historian head on not not even a novelist head on and certainly not my own head on, if you see what I mean. So I had a lot of help, like UCL has this extraordinary record of all the plantations in Jamaica, which gives you every name, every detail. And there are a few accounts, um, first person accounts, but they're always to be handled with care because they're usually told through uh, German missionaries or English missionaries who uh, took first person accounts from Jamaican slaves and wrote them down. So you have to kind of uh, counter them with other documents, but there was a, enough for me to get a hold on. I think the thing I really wanted to look at, it, uh, everything with the book, it was about trying to find a version of the past that isn't as flat as the one we tend to have, which is uh, oldie timey Victorians never did anything interesting or only did this or never had sex or completely boring. And But the other flattened thing is that Jamaican slavery is exactly the same as America or Brazil. Or, and of course, real historians know that is not the case. It's not a question of whether one's better or worse, or slavery is slavery. There is no kind of moral uh, uh, ladder in the in states of slavery, but the difference is important. And with Bogle in court in England, that's another key difference. Like when I was talking to my students, I would realize that they have always believed or thought that American racial laws were global, but of course that's not the mm. case. A black man like Andrew Bogle could give two years of witness testimony in England. In America, he wouldn't be allowed to enter the courtroom. So it's a very, very different system. And it's very interesting that this absence of laws creates these strange transitions. Because there isn't a racial law, there isn't even a a certain law about what happens to a slave when they enter England. All these extraordinary lives occur where people pass from states of absolute subjection and servitude into a, a more normal servant existence and sometimes dependence and sometimes even wealth. And if you want to know British history, you kind of need to know that, that this is a separate country with all kinds of strange things happening. 
And you have to also think about the difference between sugar plantations to tobacco plantations. Or, so all of that was interesting to me because I'd never, you don't learn it in British schools. So you, I really had to do it myself. And I think the whole novel wouldn't have happened without this incredible explosion of um, academic work in this area, particularly someone like David Olasoga, who has popularized and spread um, a, 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 the truth, a history that is full and complete and detailed and in no way, um, you know, fantastical or ideological. He's just interested in the facts. Mm. And so having a man like that published at this point in my life was super useful. Yeah. Big, big thanks to David Olasoga. Thank you so much yeah. for yeah. helping I mean, with the research. All our it's a transformative thing when someone writes a history book which um, tells the entirety of the history instead of a partial version of it. Mm. With, um, with Andrew Bogle, there's always been this sort of question about whether he was part of a fraudulent claim or whether he was just simply an unwitting participant yeah. uh, in one. But you seem to hint at something which is far more complex in the novel. And I wondered whether after all that work that you've done, whether you are clear about his motivation or is the fictionalised Bogle very separate to the sort of historical figure, if you like? I mean, everything that happens in the novel it happened to him pretty much. Um, I, I don't I don't think I ever got it clear in my mind. It's I think the beginning of it is genuinely a muddle. It's just one of those crazy coincidences. They bump into each other. Maybe Bogle gave too much information in the first instance. And then it's a case of being in too deep to get out. I really, while I was writing it, watching the Trump campaign, I thought I saw several people around Trump who found themselves in that situation, right? You think it's going to be a good ride for a minute, and then suddenly you're in too deep, then you can't get out, then it kind of drags you down. Um, and I, I do think something like that happened to Bogle. But I also think, from reading the transcripts, of which I just show a tiny part, there are volumes and volumes, that he was a real genius with a story you know he kept that entire British public hanging on his every word for two years that's that is a kind of narrative genius and they, there is a possibility too that he was enjoying himself I think mean, that's that's worth um that's worth considering because he does seem to enjoy being in court of course at some point he had to keep going because he was hoping for money he was deserving of money um the individual reparations he deserved from that family are incalculable so he must have thought, at least give me my fifty pounds a year, so I can completely understand why he wouldn't walk away from it. Um, but I, I also like the idea of him being in conspiracy with um, Titchborn. The only problem is that I don't think Arthur Walton was clever enough for a conspiracy. <laughs> Bogle would have been doing it by himself. We've reached the point where I, I have to ask you about uh, Charles Dickens. Um, mm. You've mentioned that you you left the UK at a time when you could barely switch on the TV without stumbling upon a TV adaptation of <laughs> yeah. something by Dickens. Uh, and now that you're back in the UK, um, writers all over the place are finding inspiration again. Of course, Barbara King Solver recently winning the Pulitzer. Yeah. And it's the so Women's moving, Pride. really. <laughs> it really well, is you, moving. It's incredible. Well, it is incredible. You, you wrote an essay recently in The New Yorker, which was called On, on Killing Charles Dickens. And uh, it seems that he's very much alive. But why do you think he is a writer that just continues to inspire other writers and, and to remain part of our, our canon? I think I was talking to George Saunders about it a while ago for something. And he's, he's a very big fan of the Christmas Carol and so am I. And Christmas Carol is one of those things where, you know, you know, it's, it's a kind of manipulative protestant machine you enter into it and it works on you but but even when you know it even when you're an adult even when you've read it a million times you've seen it on tv a million times it it works it functions every single time i've read it to my children i've watched it and it's amazing to see what it does to people it's so um it is so morally manipulative but it is so um transformative too it really is about the possibility of change and I don't think uh, people ever get tired of that dream for themselves and it it takes some of our oldest ethical ideas not just from Christianity but our oldest ethical conceptions and creates a story out of them and I don't think many people in the history of writing have been able to do that so completely I don't know if it's something you want to be doing <laughs> but but he did it 
he did it perfectly. And um, it's, I have all kinds of questions about it as an adult because it really is an intimate morality. It's not about how a society might get better. It's not about how you might bring justice to people or change an economic system. It's about how you would change your soul. So from that point of view, it's limited politically, but at the same time, people do tend to feel that they have souls <laughs> and they do <laughs> find themselves in states of despair and sadness and with a desire to be better and be better in the world. And as long as people feel that, Dickens will have an effect on them. And am I right in thinking that you employed a sort of Dickens-like method for, for writing this book? You would write a chunk and you would send that off and then you would move on to the next chunk and you would do that as you went through the book. And yeah. of course you did a final edit, but you were sort of writing it episodically like, like he did. I think spending all that time in the Victorian period, you, you were humbled a lot. And one of the things that you were humbled by is the speed in which novels were written <laughs> and, and speed at which they had always been written until the 20th century, when it went from being a way to make your crust, earn money and survive to something that, was preserved in universities and in departments or for the, only for the rich or the aristocratic or that people would leisure. And that is a shame because it's, it's created a model of the novel where it's perfectly normal for me to meet a student who started a novel, you know, four years ago. And when I ask them how it's going, they're like, well, I'm still on draft two, as if that means something. It doesn't mean anything to me. What does draft <laughs> two mean? Whereas in 1840, you wrote because you needed the money you needed it week by week it had to be published and those novels though they are not the kind of crystalline perfect things we start making in the 60s 70s 80s and 90s um survive they still exist i mean some of them are very funny to me like i'll be reading a dickens novel and right in the middle would be a rant about theatrical producers you're like i don't think you meant to put this in the middle of our mutual friend i think that was just (laughs) Tuesday and you're in a bad mood and so they're full of those kind of crazy uneven things but they have this energy and I think part of it is because he's writing they're all writing to some degree subconsciously the plan is vague you have like some sense of what you where you're going with the woman in white or once you start writing you you're writing quite freely you know like with speed and it creates really interesting novels because they're coming from a place that isn't particularly protected you know um so I just wanted to try that I wanted to try to write to order in a time frame that's cramped and really knowing that my readers my two readers (laughs) wanted the next part and were and had opinions and were interested I thought that was an interesting way to write instead of this kind of ivory tower idea Mm. Um, I was speaking to Miriam Margulies recently, who, of course, is a massive fan of the Yeah. And I asked her why she was such a fan. And she just said that because as soon as you open the book, whatever page you land on, you're immediately transported somewhere with these characters that are very, very clear. And you've spoken about how, of course, it's possible for lots of people to, to have a go at writing. And what you end up with is a story, but with characters that are dead, they don't sort of live on the page. Anybody who has read The Fraud will know that these characters are immediately alive. And in fact, you were surprised by how alive Eliza Touche was and she just took control of the story from you. How do you as a writer make sure that those characters are alive? What is the process by which you make sure that you haven't written something that's dead on the page? Um, Look, I want to say first, I don't think that's the only thing fiction can do. It's just one tiny room in the house of fiction. And it just happens at Dickens dominates that room and it happens that people like to go into that room because it's a fun one (laughs) it's full of people who seem very clear as you say and and that's the right word I think the problem with that kind of clarity of character is that people aren't quite like that they're like that from a distance so when you're observing people they are absurd or funny or they say the same thing over and over they have tics or but of course we know from the inside that we don't feel like characters we don't feel like you know flat people who always do the same thing and So the problem with Dickens is always that negotiation, that it's very entertaining to point at other people, but we know that life doesn't really always feel like that from the inside. So for me, that's the the glory of Dickens, but also the limit of him. And Mm. I guess when I'm writing, though I'm interested in character, though it comes, I would say, relatively easily to me to make up people, I I consider it a kind of um, poison chalice, because if all my writing was, was 
look at these ridiculous people. I would be I would be sad about that. I would consider something lost in translation. So that was the gift of Mrs. Touche because she definitely has that within her to look at everybody as a as a comic or tragic figure. But she is also aware that life is mysterious and that she doesn't know everything. Hmm. Things she thinks she knows. She these are appearances and. Dickens is a master of appearances, but there was lots of things he didn't know more than anything himself. He turned out to be someone who really didn't understand what he wanted from life or how to raise children or how to treat his wife decently. A lot of life was mysterious to him. But if you put him in a cafe and there were 50 people there, he could do a comic sketch of every single one of them. So it's it's like having a good ear. It's a gift to a degree. Um, but I don't think that's all that novels should be for. And I hope that's not all my novels are for. But in this one, it's really about that. You know, it's about what is a character? How do you make it? What does it mean to have character? So those were kind of questions of the novel anyway. But um, how not to make flat characters? To me, it's about uh, their speech, not to write by a template. And also, whenever you try and force a character to prove some argument of yours or because you feel insecure or something, but it just shows. You learn it as you get older, you can see it immediately. It's just, you put your hand a little bit too hard on the scale. And usually you've done that because you want to appear a certain way. And the moment you do that, you've done something to the characters that's wrong. The scary thing about not doing that is that of course the reader gets to look at all these people and think, Jesus, which one of these is Zadie? They're all fucking <laughs> crazy. But that's that's the risk, I guess. You just let them go and you stop worrying what people think about you or them. Or, and then they get to have a bit more freedom. <laughs> I was going to ask you one more question before I uh, went to the questions that have come via our booksellers. But actually, one of their questions is pretty much what I was going to ask. Um, Amanda had asked, even though this is a historical novel, are there aspects of the story inspired by current issues, events or characters? And I was really surprised to hear you say um, a couple of weeks ago that th the, there were elements of this story which are really about our current climate crisis. And I think people might not notice that necessarily, obviously, no, when no, reading the book. Yes. But well, I, can you tell us a little bit about why there is that connection and, 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 and what it, how that feeds into this novel? I think something in my mind about four or five years ago, reading particularly sometimes younger people talking about the past, talking about slavery, this enormous reckoning that's been going on in England. Um, one of the things I kept hearing people say is express this kind of moral amazement that such a thing ever existed and how did so many people just let it exist? And so if you don't have a complicated moral imagination, the only answer to that is everybody was rabidly evil and possibly insane. So that's that's what interested me. And then I would think of the analogy of what my children or my children's children will say in 50 years, which is how was it that the literal world was ending? The world was ending and you were still getting on planes and reading tabloid stories and uh, on Instagram for five hours a day. And what were you doing? And of course, once you make that analogy, you realize that it is always possible. It's not that there aren't people, heroic people, who are fighting with every part of their body and mind against a great injustice. Those people always exist. But the problem is there's not very many of them. The great majority of us, most of the time, do absolutely nothing or do the bare minimum in order to get on with our lives. And the pressure between the great injustice and our intimate life is constant. And uh, that really fascinated me. And then the other kind of complicated moral question of it is how do you end enormous injustices? And looking at slavery over 400 years, it just seemed to me that the answer is with all hands on deck, all kinds of hands, uh, pure hands, dirty hands, missionary hands, slave hands themselves, of course, um, crazy activists, sane activists, political groups, unpolitical, like it's it took everybody. And parliament, it took so many different kinds of forces and if the people who were trying to end slavery, including the slaves, had waited for a per perfect moral rectitude from the people of England, we'd still have slaves. Mm. So it's about learning that radical political movements involve a lot of different actors with a lot of different motives, um, but they can work. So I found it both a kind of hopeful thing that such things can end. It doesn't mean that heaven immediately 
appears on earth, but things can change. And it, I needed to know that for myself. Like, what does radical action look like? Looking back on the Chartist movement, the movement for the working class vote, the movement for women's vote, the ends of slavery, that is not the lesson you learn if you read the history books. Fascinating stuff. So I hope that answers your question, uh, Amanda. Um, Jen has asked, um, as someone who holds pockets of London within your stories, how has living in different countries influenced your writing? Do you feel it's had an impact? So I think I really did get ashamed of myself. I thought I can't ask Europeans to read my books in translation while I sit like roast beef Englishmen refusing to learn a foreign tongue. So I tried French, it didn't work. So I tried Italian and uh, I can speak Italian pretty much. And it was just a great enrichment to my life and to and to my writing because you become aware of language just becomes much more distinct to you understand how much is contingent how much is about tone and register and so that was enormous for me and then going to America I think it really meant a lot to me to be in New York to be amongst this massive kind of African-American cultural class to meet you know black painters black singers black writers I, I didn't know that from Wilson. That's not something I would have come across in Wilson as a kid. So to be in New York was really enlightening and exciting and just fun. You know, I had a lot of fun. And my idea of short stories, of essays, of, of literary life just kind of expanded out of the NW6 postcode, <laughs> which was a good thing too. Yeah. Um, and uh, Tara um, has asked, how your writing has changed over the years. Have you found yourself learning things from the writing of the different books? And what in particular did you take from the process of writing The Fraud? I think writers think they get better each book. Of course, the evidence for readers is that is not the case. <laughs> but as a reader, that's not true. But you learn, I do, I do think it's fair to say that for writers, unlike for almost every other profession, um, the 40s and 50s, is a good time because you have a lot of technical skill and you're not yet, you know, gaga or reactionary or whatever's going to happen in your English novelist life, become a Catholic, conservative, whatever goes on at the end of English novelist life. So it's a good, um, it's a good moment. Everything's working together. So uh, I've really looked forward to this time in my life and I feel like I have the tools to write the books I want to write. That's the best way to put it. You'll never have the energy. Like I can't, whatever's contained in white teeth is gone for me now because I'm not 24. But but I know how to make characters. I know you don't need 50 pages. You don't, you know, don't need to describe anybody's clothes or face. Or I know you don't need the present tense to make something feel like it's happening right now. Like you learn things. So uh, to me, the writing in the fraud I don't know about the structure of it, or the, but the writing is is so superior to anything I've ever written in my view because it uses the least words to say the things I want to say, which is my definition of good writing. It's a great definition. It's really interesting you mentioned there about about structure, and I hope you don't mind if we just touch a little bit on that because it the the book does move around in time and and place, and you mentioned that what you had done really was to assemble something that was more like a sort of emotional timeline of, of the novel. Could you tell us a little bit more about what you mean by that? Because it's really fascinating. Um, I think part, it goes back, it's in all my fiction, I notice it. And I think it's something to do with my subject position. Like if I was part of the majority culture, maybe if I was a middle-class woman, a white woman, and, and we were talking about the same books, and same, I could tell a story from A to Z with the assumption that you would know everything. But because I wasn't that, I was always having to write, knowing that you have an idea about me that I don't necessarily think is correct, and blah, 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 and you think my character, there's a lot of double think going on. But of course, I don't experience that double think as, as an oppression. I, I kind of think it's an enormous opportunity because you get, you know, you kind of grow up knowing what you are in the mind of the other. And that's a very, uh, it's a natural position for a novelist, you know? So I'm always aware. That, like, even in White Teeth, if I put these characters, if, for instance, I put the Bengali family, you're already in your mind into arranged marriages, and, you know, it's 1999. So I, I'm working against a silent 
majority having their ideas. So I've always had to write round that block of cliche and stereotype or whatever it is. It's just sitting there in the middle of every book. So you have to kind of get quite creative to go around that. And um, it, it, that's just, I think it's deep in the structure of my mind and in the, in the novels. So you have to, if I put, if I say the word plantation, I put, I know you're already thinking of roots. You've already got 12 years a slave. You know, I, you're, I'm already having to write against your cinematic version of this. So that's what was in front of me. So telling the story in which you meet someone, then you learn something from way back, then you come back forward, you're constantly revising your view in a more and more precise point as to who these people really are, not your cliched version, not the Victorian woman or the black man or the ex-slave or these actual human beings. So that is the reason for it, I think, in my mind. And also, I just really wanted to make a defense of the art of reading. The art of reading, because we spend so much time reading those long blocks of text online, it is amazing to me. Like we've given this book to a few people and they've been so confused. I'm like, dude, it's not that confusing. It's like you've been reading in this crazy linear way for like since 2008. And I can show you novels from, you know, 1905, 1876, which are more structurally complicated and interesting than this one. This is really not that complicated. But our, our ability to read is slightly degraded at the moment. So, and that's me too. Like I, I also am reading the you know, New York Times article and skipping every third paragraph and just trying to get the basics and picture. Yes, got it, got it, got it. So <laughs> for me, it's about really remembering what reading is. And reading involves like a little bit of work on your part, <laughs> a little <laughs> bit of comprehension and movement. And just as life does, if you walk into a pub, people don't line up in a line and say, you know, well, maybe they do these days. I'm Emily, I'm a Sagittarius. And this is, I'm this kind of person. No, you have to kind of figure it out. Um, so to me, a novel is like that. I'm glad I'm not the only one who simply reads the headline of an article and thinks that that means I've read Terrible, the whole thing. I know, it's, it's wild, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, to finish off, I, I'm going to uh, ask you a question which has come in from, from Phil, and he says that uh, as an author that is so often cited as an inspiration for new authors, what is it that you look for in new authors that in turn inspires you? I just want something new. It doesn't have to be... Um, there's different kinds of newness that maybe the smallest newness to me is at the level of content. So you're writing about people or things you consider most people don't know about. I mean, it's interesting, but it's not that interesting. That's like, that's something like journalism. Like I can get into it, but I usually the assumption that uh, you've never met people like this before is usually too much of an assumption because I usually have met people like that before as have most people. So for me, the content, you know, if, I, that was part of white teeth, right? Like you meant to, to certain kind of person, it was a surprise, I guess, to meet these voluble black and Asian North Londoners, but not to me, <laughs> like they weren't new to me. So I consider the level of content newness being, it is it is something, it's no doubt it's something, but it's not as much as maybe sometimes people think it is. To me, the only really new thing is a new way of writing, a new kind of sentence and a new sensibility. And that's all that I'm looking for. But if you could be writing about the most fascinating, unusual people in the world, if it's in the same kind of prose that I read online yesterday, I just I just don't care. To me, it really has to be fresh at the level of the page. Otherwise, I could be watching a TV movie about it. I could read an article about it. There has to be a reason why it's a novel. Like news can come in many forms. Novels don't have to bring news. Sometimes they bring it by accident. Sometimes it's an added exciting thing, but it can't be the only thing. Though I like everybody like to travel in fiction. Like if I can't help but be fascinated by a novel set in Japan because I've never been to Japan. I've always wanted to go to Japan. So that part is a natural part of any reader. But to me, it's only one aspect of what matters in fiction. And are there any names you'd like to mention? Any authors out there that people should be looking out for? Oh, yes, I've been on such a long time at my desk. I'm only now getting writing again, but um, I mean, reading again. Um, I did really like that this person, I think there were they, Isabel Wadener, um, who I think won the Goldsmith Prize. Her new novel, Corey Farda, Social Mobility, 
really entertained me. I just read that. And Jenny Erpenbeck, Kairos, mm-hmm. beautiful novel. I can't wait for Teju Cole's novel, which I think is out in September, which I haven't been given yet. I'm looking at The Secret Diaries of Charles Ignatius Sancho, which I just started reading, which is also really incredible. And this is kind of a dark neighborhood. Vanessa, I'm going to say his name wrong. I think it might be a Nigerian name, Onwu Amezi. The short story is very unusual. Um, so, yeah, and actually a graphic novel called In by, he's a Scottish graphic novelist, Will McPhee, maybe? He does cartoons for New Yorker sometimes. It's absolutely fantastic, I just read. But yeah, a bit of everything. Like, I'm interested in what's going on. Excellent. Well, listen, Sadie, thank you for those. Thank you, everybody, for your questions. Really, really great to be able to ask some of those. Uh, and Zadie, thank you for the fraud. It's just been a fantastic read and even more fascinating to, to hear so much about what went into the book. So thank you for your time. Thank you. And thank you, guys. Sorry I didn't get to all the questions. but <laughs> Thank you.